Merci Chuck. Et donc maintenant la troisième présentation de cette première partie de ce matin. Donc le professeur Marie-Jeanne Crick, pareil, qui est connu de tous les participants réguliers de THS. Marie-Jeanne Crick a de nombreux titres. L'auteur dirige une équipe extrêmement importante qui mène des travaux, qui est, qui est le successeur, puisqu'elle a été l'élève direct de Doll et nice Wonder. Et donc sa présentation va porter sur la question de la, du stress, de la génétique et de, de l'action de l'environnement dans euh, la mise en place et le maintien des problèmes d'addiction. Merci beaucoup, Marc. Laissez-moi. I do not speak French and you don't want me to try. What a pleasure to be here. And I want to especially thank my very, very good friend, Jean-Pierre Delaud, who has put together yet again a phenomenal meeting, but even more importantly, an extremely warm event with many activities. And being who I am and what I am, I hate to say this, but maybe I really love saying this. The biggest treat for me on this trip, I think, will have been not the magnificent meals, the beautiful sea and hotel, and the great convention, but rather going to the clinic and talking to staff who are in front row of taking care of those who are very dear to me the patients with addictive diseases. I think Dr. Kleber gave an absolutely brilliant talk, and I have to advertise my friends from New York and from Philadelphia. I so appreciated Chuck's comments. And I will say out loud, even though it's not question period yet, that I do wish we could have used the term addictions. And not one addiction, note my slide title, Addictions, specific addictions, they are diseases. And as long as we talk about disorder, we haven't really defined the diseases. And I think we will not be able to move forth in getting rid of stigma. We pretend like it's something else that we know people don't like. And if it's gambling or if it's using a computer, well, maybe like alcohol, but if it's cocaine or if it's heroin, then it's another matter. So I, uh, I supported Chuck, many of us did. He didn't win that particular battle, so we're going to say substance use disorders. Now, ancient history, my early childhood. Herb Kleber said that I assisted Vince And that's true, but actually, Marie also assisted Vince. I was recruited, and Marie was recruited, in the autumn of 1963. I was recruited because I was a young physician in training who had been pre-programmed through my work at Columbia and at the NIH to go into science. Some field, not yet determined, but clearly a mixture of bench and laboratory science. Marie, on the other hand, was a seasoned psychiatrist. She had worked on the streets of New York in Lexington at the old Public Health Service Addiction Hospital, where they wished to find a non-addicting pain medication. The goal was not treatment of addiction. It was simply getting addicts off whatever they came in on, primarily heroin or Demerol for the physician-nurse addicts, and then to have them as study subjects for new medications. Marie had written a book called The Addict as a Patient because she had been singularly struck that the very best pundits in her field of psychiatry, either working humanely or very inhumanely, had not been able to solve the problems of addiction. So Marie and I both arrived at the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research, its then name, in the January of 1964, and we began a very close teamwork of three people. The only thing, I had to leave after six months to go finish my training in gastroenterology, liver disease, and neuroendocrinology, and then return full time. But while I was gone, I conducted the prospective studies, the medical studies that led to the approval of methadone as used in maintenance treatment of addiction. 
while Marie did the first translational work. That is, she took what we had developed in our tower down to the streets of New York to a proprietary hospital, the Manhattan General Hospital, later to become part of Beth Israel Medical Center, and showed she could recap what we had found in the first six months of 64. I think the most important contribution we made then, and pertaining to now, is that heroin, and we can say any of the different addictions, are diseases. They're metabolic diseases. They are diseases of the brain with behavioral manifestations featuring, as O'Brien has said, drug hunger, drug craving, and drug self-administration despite negative consequences to self and others. And as Dr. Kleber said, it is not simply a personality disorder, although frequently there may be comorbid conditions, and not simply a criminal behavior, although many, if not most, illicit drug addicts exhibit criminal behavior. So we conducted the first studies in the inpatient research unit of the Rockefeller Hospital, then under the leadership of the true discoverer of the function of DNA, Dr. Macklin McCarty, who with McLeod and Avery in 1946 described the role of DNA, a chemical discovered a, decade, a century earlier by Miescher in Switzerland. And Mac let us have an open unit, so never did we have a locked unit. We taught our potential research subjects that if they used drugs, they would be dispatched. And we hoped they wouldn't, but we understood the power of craving. We began our work with a concept that one needs to combine a pharmacotherapy with counseling, psychiatric care, and medical care as needed. And I think the rest is rather like history. We saved the first research to present at the Old Turks, a very prestigious U.S. organization, in May of 66. Therefore, the second publication was actually the first research. And that can be easily seen if you go to the first paper published in 65, the translational study, where Marie points out the one-year follow-up of the patients that I admitted to the Rockefeller Hospital with Vince and Marie, and which we studied initially and who were remaining in treatment one year later. And also the cross-tolerance studies are duly cited there. But when Dole presented our 64 findings at the Old Turks, and it was published in the transactions and then the archives, it was very interesting. He thought people would be so excited that there was now an effective treatment for opiate addiction. But I refer to you that original transcription, which is very available, and you will see that people ask questions, which Dr. Kleber just answered this morning. When are you going to get these people off methadone? Or why are you giving them one opiate for another? And as I said in France in 1993 with my impossible French, ce n'est pas substitution, c'est replacement, a medicine that replaces what our lab and many others have now proven is a relative endorphin deficiency that develops with or without a priori genetic factors after chronic use of short-acting narcotics such as heroin and persists for long periods of time. Now, the cartoons from the 66 paper, the 64 work, on the left you will see highs and lows, heroin, three to six times a day, or Vicodin, or Oxycontin, three to six times a day, on off, to get a high, but then into withdrawal. If too much is taken, overdose. What we found when we started with methadone, and there were no technologies, no gas chromatography, radio immunoassay yet, not until 73, Chuck and Teresi and I developed the first techniques to measure things. But what we found, if we started with a dose of 20 to 40 milligrams a day, which wouldn't harm a naive individual, and then slowly increase that dose up to 80 to 120 milligrams a day. We saw no high, no euphoria, but also no withdrawal. We saw a steady state, and it's that steady state that allows normalization of physiology, which has been disrupted by the jackhammer effect of heroin going on and off. But it's also that steady state 
that allows people to receive and accept counseling, medical care, job training, and get back to more normal lives. On the right, you'll see the actual pharmacokinetics, which independently, though now we're connected through our NIDA center, Chuck and Teresi and I developed techniques. And Chuck found that heroin itself has a half-life of three minutes. It's really a prodrug and not active. Its first metabolite, the 6-acetyl morphine, is active. It has a half-life of 30 minutes and morphine itself for about four hours. In contrast, both my lab and Chuck's show that methadone has a half-life of 24 hours for the racemic mixture. And in my group, using stable isotope technology and mass spectrometry, we went on to show the active enantiomer, the L so-called form, or R enantiomer more correctly, has a half-life of 48 hours. So we did have indeed a steady state, and although I'm not going into the profile, buprenorphine also has very long-acting properties because of tight binding to the mu receptor. With methadone, it's pharmacokinetics, and we have learned that our liver acts as a gigantic sustained release capsule to release methadone in unchanged form into the bloodstream. So both methadone and buprenorphine share this critical property. Now, as mentioned briefly, there are now over a million persons in methadone treatment worldwide, including about 250 to 260 in US and about 250 in uh, the rest of the world and about 500,000 here in Europe. And we know that um, methadone is very effective if you use adequate doses, which are 80, and now because of increased purity of heroin in US at least, up to 150 milligrams per day, not the original 120 that we recommended. And we have found in very recent 2005 to 2011 prospective studies that we get over a 60% to 80% one-year voluntary retention if adequate doses of methadone are used and, as McClellan and O'Brien taught us and we've heard, adequate doses of counseling and access to medical and other types of care are provided. And I think, as Dr. Kleber presented, this is going to pertain with all data coming out with buprenorphine. We need to have services of a variety of types. I'm pleased to say I've just come from Sweden here to France, and in Sweden four years ago, they finally put into play a treatment system where you're entered into an opiate treatment program, and you may be treated with either buprenorphine or methadone, depending on what the doctor and counselors and patient feel is most appropriate. And then if they find you need to progress to a medication that has more effectiveness for very high tolerant dependent persons, they will shift from buprenorphine to methadone. With four years of experience, they're now finding 70% of their patients are receiving methadone maintenance daily and 30% buprenorphine naloxone. They use only the combination product. Now we know that methadone prevents withdrawal symptoms and drug hunger. It blocks the euphoric effects of superimposed narcotics. I won't go into those studies. They were done in 64. I refer you to the 66 narcotic blockade paper. But also that it allows normalization of physiology disrupted by short-acting opiates. And we know that methadone is a full mu agonist. It internalizes when it binds to the mu receptor. It acts just like an endorphin, like beta endorphin, like in Keflin. And it also has modest NMDA receptor antagonist action, which retards the development of tolerance. As Dr. Kleber said, and I congratulate him for clarifying this, uh, buprenorphine has some orphanin activity, which may or may not have significant properties, but it has kappa activity. I prefer just to call it that. It is a partial agonist at the kappa receptor, precisely stated. When high doses are used, it acts as an antagonist to the kappa receptor. But as he pointed out, when you get down to two milligrams, it acts as an agonist. And I'm not giving my usual neurobiology basic science lecture today, but we know that the kappa system causes dysphoria, 
It causes depression. We wrote about that 25 years ago now, in 87, along with Cleavers, I recall, as we were talking about early medications like cyclozacine and ethylketocyclozacine. So we have to be aware that the capinus of buprenorphine is a mixed thing, antagonist to agonist, or as we correctly call, a partial agonist. Okay, medications. We have two terrific ones, methadone and buprenorphine naloxone. As far as I'm concerned, you should always have naloxone combined. Very strong feelings. I can expand on that. Uh, naltrexone has been effective in less than 15% of subjects who've been studied primarily in the 80s by several on this stage. And sustained release naltrexone has been effective in those under contracts, such as parolees or persons in a country like Russia where they have no other treatment but it needs to be studied and will be studied side by side with methadone and buprenorphine naloxone. And to date, the best data out of Russia showed less than a 50% six-month retention and uh, far from abstinence developed. So I think we have a way to go before we can see where it fits in. Conversely, Chuck, along with Valpicelli and Kranzler and O'Malley, have shown that naltrexone is quite effective in the management of 30 to 50% alcoholics. And I'll show you towards the end some data. We discovered a gene variant which we predicted would increase its outcome to a positive nature with antagonist treatment for alcoholism. And that has now been proven by four different studies, including one from Chuck's group. We have no good medications yet for cocaine or amphetamine. But if I'm asked in a question and answer period or give Dr. Montoya's talk for this afternoon, I will tell you that both his lab and my lab have data both in humans and my lab three animal studies suggesting that methadone or buprenorphine may be very effective also in treating cocaine dependency because a relative endorphin deficiency even more severe develops in that setting. And again, an opioid agonist or partial agonist may be replacement treatment. But also in amphetamine addiction, as Comer will present, uh, my colleague and former trainee Johann Frank in Stockholm has shown that naltrexone may be effective. Again, activating the stress axis, which is the topic today. Now, very early on, actually in 64, when I began the prospective studies, I hypothesized, being a young endocrinologist in training, that addiction was in part an endocrine-like disorder and that atypical stress responsivity contributed both to the acquisition and relapse to addictive diseases. That an atypical responsivity to stress and stressors would continue to the perpetuation of addictions, including especially relapse after being uh, abstinent. And that in some individuals, even in 64, I read our early writings, in some individuals, this atypical stress responsivity might have existed before exposure to the short-acting opiate heroin on a genetic or environmental basis. We would now say genetic or epigenetic basis. And in fact, that uh, this has now been proven to be true was not a surprise. But we also predicted that drugs of abuse would alter stress responsivity. I cannot believe I didn't bring the circle that I always show in every lecture I give, but I didn't. But like Chuck, uh, that one was left out. And what in that circle I show is there are three sets of factors that contribute to the vulnerability to develop any addiction. One is environmental factors, cues, set and setting, peer pressure, but also stress and stressors. A second are drug-induced changes of the brain, which we predicted and in the mid-80s began to show, now shown by many, are predictably caused, predictably caused by each of the drugs of abuse, and they're not identical changes. We see changes particularly in the dopaminergic system, but also, and I think more importantly, of the opioidergic system, including the mu, which is involved in reward, and the kappa, which is involved in countermodulation of reward, whether it be heroin, chocolate, raspberries, or possibly gambling. So we have mu reward, kappa countermodulation of reward, and dopamine is a corollary. 
We also have the serotonin system involved in and cascades of other short and fast transmitters and neuropeptides. Now this is a cartoon of the human brain and we release actually from the hypothalamus two peptide hormones. Most attention in the addiction literature over the last 15, 20 years has been on CRF, which acts in the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis on the anterior pituitary to bring about the processing and release of pro-opio-melanocortin, possibly my favorite gene product because it releases beta-endorphin, the longest of our endorphins, and ACTH. ACTH acts at our adrenal gland to allow us to survive stressful situations, but cortisol then acts in a negative feedback mode to turn off the CRF in a circadian fashion, as shown here. In early work, we, building on the first observation of Volovka, uh, showed that the endogenous opioids also modulate this system with the mu ligands, primarily beta-endorphin, acting at both hypothalamic and anterior pituitary sites, as shown in center here, causes um, uh, inhibition of a tonic, not daily circadian, but a tonic, steady manner. So if you remove the mu receptor by use of an antagonist, slower, Sandy, or softer? Slower. If you remove the, thanks, if you remove the mu activity by an antagonist, you will then see activation of this axis activation. And I'll show you this again. But another peptide, which my laboratory is now studying at the human level, and which we and other groups have shown at the laboratory level, is playing a very important role in the addictions, is arginine vasopressin, or as those clinicians in the audience from U.S. at least know it, antidiuretic hormone. And this is another exquisitely important stress hormone that has precisely the same effect as CRF, but acting on a different receptor set in the anterior pituitary. And parenthetically, both CRF and vasopressin act throughout the brain. Now, animals. I say to my psychiatry colleagues that I don't have to worry about the Freudian aspects of my rats and mice. They have a mother and father, but I have no idea about their relationship to their mother and father. However, I know they do come in different strains, or you can use an outbred strain. Now, when we give cocaine a different drug, but which will be addressed this meeting, in a binge-like pattern, mimicking the most common pattern of human use, we see activation of the stress axis, but then with time, as you see here on day three and 14, the activation goes away and the hormone levels fall along with falling of CRF neuropeptide. If animals are allowed to self-administer cocaine, they will rapidly escalate their dose and changing from the usual paradigm, my lab and also that of Kube went to long access, Coop to six hours, and our group to 10 and now 18 hour sessions. And as you'll see, the higher the dose and the long access, the animals use more and more cocaine. And this in fact has taught our laboratory group to use even higher doses of cocaine in the binge. But look at the lower right. The cortisol, the important stress hormone, blue is pre-cocaine. Highest levels when night occurs, just the flip, the opposite of humans. Rats and mice get up and run around during the night. We go to sleep, maybe. So you see the highest levels, and then they fall in that activity period. But cocaine use for only one or two days flattens that circadian pattern, and then reverses. And even after only five days of exposure, self-exposure, you will notice that they have lower than normal levels of hormones. Now, we know that the heroin addict wants to avoid stress, but in fact, we have increasing evidence that the animal models and the humans, cocaine addicts and alcoholics, want a slight activation 
of this stress system. Not too much, but some, and they actually seek it. Now, we've taken two strains of rats, fishers, shown in yellow, not particularly excited by drugs abuse. Lewis, shown in green, love using alcohol, love using cocaine, love using heroin. And look at what happens here as we give them 18 hours a day of access to cocaine, and they choose their dose. They self-escalate their dose. We see that the Lewis uses more and more and more. When we ask the question about the hormone levels, ACTH on the left, cortisol on the right, you will see that the Lewis animals simply don't get an elevation in their ACTH in court, whereas the Fisher does. The Fisher gets the elevation, stays flat with the use of cocaine, whereas the Lewis, with no elevation, keeps pressing that lever. Now, we've given binge alcohol, a study done with Johann Frank, now head of addiction services as well as professor at the Karolinska in Stockholm, and what we showed was this HPA axis is activated by one day of alcohol, but by 14 days, tolerance or adaptation develops to this, just as I showed you with cocaine. Now, Stephanie O'Malley and I, working together in a human study with ethical approval, allowed alcoholics to be placed either on placebo or naltrexone for one week in an inpatient research setting, and then they were given, as shown at the middle arrow, a choice for one hour and then a second hour of up to four drinks or $3. Those on naltrexone drank very few drinks, less than two. And this was the first laboratory study built on the clinical studies of O'Brien Valpicelli and O'Malley and this was replicated later by Harriet DeWitt, that naltrexone decreases choice of alcohol in a laboratory setting as well as in the field. Compared to placebo, where people drank five drinks and took less money. But look what happens to the HPA axis. I have told you the mu opioid receptor inhibits this axis. And you know that naltrexone, naloxone, and nemephine block that inhibition. So you no longer have the tolerance that I showed you with the animal study, or I could show you with the human study. You are able to get alcohol-induced activation of this stress-responsive axis. And if you look at the right-hand side, green, naltrexone-treated patients, really liked that activation. Blue, placebo, didn't get that activation, and they want to try to achieve it, which can be facilitated by the antagonist treatment. Now, what have we learned in our many, many years of human studies? We have learned that acutely and on a chronic basis, opiates, short-acting opiates, depress the HPA axis. In long-term methadone-maintained treatment, within two months of stabilization on moderate to high dose, you see complete normalization of this axis. Opiate antagonists act just like opiate withdrawal. You see activation of this axis, which we, in early 1980 studies, based on what we had observed in our humans, plus Al Schuler's brilliant work in monkeys, we predicted, and later Chuck showed this in rats, that naltrexone or some antagonist would be effective in treating alcoholism because it goes in the same direction as the drug itself does. Similarly, methadone is an opiate, and it goes in the same direction as the short-acting heroin does, and buprenorphine similarly long-acting. Cocaine activates this axis as well, and as I've showed you, alcohol activates this axis. The normalization, we think, is critical for the success of methadone and probably buprenorphine treatment, and this normalization does occur with time. We've studied and now are studying and hope to study further buprenorphine. And our challenge studies, as well as our rodent studies, have proven that a relative endorphin deficiency develops both in opiate addiction when medication and drug-free and in cocaine addiction. 
Now, I will not extol all the praises of the mu opioid receptor system, but they are numerous, and it functions range from managing pain to managing our gastrointestinal motility. And yes, my lab showed you could reverse the constipation in pain patients by using an orally available but not systemically available antagonist, such as naloxone. And that has now been reduced with different compounds by two companies in the past five years, and very effective. Immune function, cardiovascular function, pulmonary function, mood cognition, and affect are also modulated or regulated by the immune system. So as soon as the first opioid receptor was cloned by Evans and Kiefer, across the world from each other, same technique, that was the Delta receptor. Leyu, then at Indiana, now at Rutgers, cloned the mu opioid receptor. And joining forces with Leia, we did studies to determine what were the variants the single base change, the single nucleotide polymorphisms or other variants of the gene for the mu receptor. And we hypothesized that there might be changes in the coding region, that is, in that part that actually binds to this mu receptor shown here. And what Leah and I found in our very large study was that, in fact, there are two common variants in the end terminus, which you see up there in, in the bloodstream where the opioids endogenous or something like morphine or heroin or methadone could bind, the binding sites. We found there were two variants, both of which result in changes in amino acids. And we predicted that such a change could alter physiology and coined a new term, which is now taking, called physiogenetics, which is patterned after the long-standing concept of gene-influencing drug metabolism, pharmacogenetics. And indeed, we've gone on to find both of these. So shown here in the upper panel, somewhat scary, green is the variant receptor, yellow is the prototype. And you'll see there's a move to the left of the green to yellow. And you will see that that suggests a tighter affinity for the ligands beta endorphin, specifically the only ligand that binds more tightly. And on the right, beta endorphin put into a molecular construct which we created with the green variant receptor gives greater signaling through one of the two major signaling pathways. And we went on many years later to show that this variant mu receptor, which one in five of you have one copy of, one in five of you in this audience, which is predominantly Caucasian, have a copy of, you will have fewer receptors on your cell surface, which is good because those receptors are more active. So you are perfectly normal, except in the setting of stress. Now, we have shown, and I alluded to this, that if you give an opioid antagonist, here shown in gray, naloxone, and in green, nemephine. Nemephine, like naltrexone, like buprenorphine, has some partial kappa activity. In humans, naloxone is purely a mu antagonist. And you'll see with the gray, two doses high and extraordinarily high, you see activation of the stress system with increase in ACTH and increase in cortisol. With the green, you have even greater activation. And this led us to realize and study further now that Kappa's system modestly activates this HPA axis, activates. The mu receptor disinhibits, the Kappa receptor system activates. And we have gone on to study persons with one or two copies of the G variant of the A118G SNP. And we found in healthy volunteers in a quiet, stress-minimized environment, there's modestly higher cortisol levels in people with one copy of this. And Gary Wan beat us to the punch. He's down at Hopkins. And he conducted one study early and then a very elegant, huge study more recently where he gave naloxone, the antagonist, as shown in N, and persons 
the green line, again, is the G variant. Much greater activation with the same doses of naloxone that caused modest activation. And remember, this is activation through disinhibition at the mu receptor. So much greater effect. And these findings, which we had predicted, and my lab also has shown, made us guess that we would see other exciting changes related to that activation. Now, another compound we can use to test this stress-responsive axis, both in healthy humans and in those with addictive diseases, is giving metyrapone, which for eight hours blocks the synthesis of cortisol. And this allows, similar to the antagonist disinhibition, increase in CRF, increase in beta endorphin, increase in ACTH. But if there's greater binding, more tight binding of the mu receptor inhibiting this axis, you get an even greater check countermodulation of this activation. So we do this test in healthy people only in this particular study. And yellow is the prototype AA and you'll see you get activation of ACTH at four hours and at eight hours. But look at the green, the variant receptor. Less activation, and again on the right, less activation if you have the G variant. And this is because the mu is acting more tightly to inhibit the beta endorphin binding to that mu receptor is causing greater inhibition with the G and GG people than the AA prototype. So we predicted that this, this variant would be associated with alcoholism. And my laboratory, enlisting the collaboration of Marcus Heilig, then at the Karolinska in Sweden, were able to show that indeed this variant, this stress-responsive functional variant, is very highly associated with opiate addiction. And in fact, the attributable risk to this one variant our genetic statistician, the renowned Jurgat, had to hold my hand when I had to present these data. 18% is huge for a contribution of one SNP to a complex disorder. Most of our human disorders are complex. They're not like sickle cell disease or cystic fibrosis. Multiple variants of multiple genes contribute to an increase or decrease vulnerability in diseases from breast cancer, to hypertension, to diabetes types 1 and 2, and to each of the addictive diseases, and the addictive diseases are different from each other. The brain changes caused by opiates are one thing, and the brain differences due to genetic factors are another that plays a role. And we also had hypothesized that this variant would be associated with alcoholism, because alcoholism in the opposite, 180 degree opposite manner, affects stress responsivity. The alcoholic wants some activation. The opiate addict wants to avoid that activation. And the variant would make it different. And indeed, it's precisely what we found when we did a second study with Heilig at the Karolinska. And I talked about this so much, I think Chuck gave up and did a fantastic study with Oslin and Cranster. He invited back in all the persons they had had in their clinical trials for treatment of alcoholism with naltrexone, and they got about one in six to come in and agree to genetics testing. And when they used these same criteria as they'd used for the FDA approval of naltrexone for alcoholism, they found that most of the people that had the very favorable response shown in the upper graph were those who had one or two copies of the gene variant. Now, this has been replicated in two subsequent studies, one by Goldman at NIAAA with Ray Anton, Carolina, and a second one, third one, has also been conducted. And Chuck, I believe, finally got funding to do his new prospective study. Thank goodness, that was a hard pull. So we have this other variant that I didn't tell you much about, and I'm not going to tell you much, except that within the last year, working with a very large cohort of women with and without HIV infection, we have been able to find out the C17T variant, 
which is extremely rare in Caucasians and very common in people of African origin. Just the flip of the A118G, which is very common in Caucasians, even more common in Asians, and very rare in people of African origin. So now with a very large cohort of African American women and using a scale we developed, the KMSK scale, which has a very high concordance with DSM-4 for opiate and for cocaine and alcohol dependency, we were able to find that this C17T variant with the TT, the recessive gene pattern, was strongly associated with both alcoholism and cocaine addiction. So you will see many more studies coming from our lab of this. Now we have done big arrays, GWASs, mini GWASs, because the full GWAS are too expensive. And with the mini GWAS, what popped out? The mu opioid receptor, not surprising, but also some of the glutamatergic system, and then one of the clock gene variants, fascinating. And then we have a hypothesis-driven array, which was developed by David Goldman, with some input from many groups, including our own. And in Caucasians, Ron and my group found the mu receptor, the kappa receptor, the delta receptor, each of which has now been corroborated by many other laboratories around the world, are associated with opiate dependency, along with casein kinase 1 epsilon and serotonin. And when we conducted the same array using African Americans, we found another very exciting series of gene variants, but it is different. And I've received so many thanks from both the African American community in US and the Hispanic community. Because although we are 99.9% .9 identical as humans, there are important differences. And in the future, we will be able not only to use a descriptor, but we already are using what we call ancestral informative markers to say that you are predominantly Caucasian, you're predominantly African, you're predominantly what have you. So in the African American community, we found glutamatergic system, Dopamine D1 came out here. And then serotonin receptor 3 and a diazepam binding uh, inhibitor. And finally, alcohol dehydrogenase gene. These are all intriguing gene variants. Epigenetics, that's changes that occur not with your DNA, but changes that occur to your DNA from various environmental factors, with methylation being the major change on DNA and a variety of different histone modulators on your RNA. DNA goes to RNA, RNA goes to a peptide. And in the study of humans, we have learned that in those with opiate dependency long-term, now in treatment with methadone, there's some significant differences at the specific sites where methylation occurs. And this occurs in each of three different ethnic culture groups with increased methylation, which means you would probably have a decrease of message. And the sites are very specifically, these mark SP1, <coughs> which are sites of promoter. Now we've done studies with the dynorphin gene, and I think the one thing to show you quickly is we have described a variant and a haplotype, that's three or more different variants together, shown on the left, CC, CC, TT. That is associated with alcohol and cocaine dependence. And look in post-mortem human brains with quantitative measurements. We have shown less dynorphin gene expression than we do in the opposite haplotype. And the most common is also lower. So lower dynorphin gene expression, less countermodulation, and I won't be showing you my animal studies where we've been able to show that dynorphin peptide itself causes a dose-dependent reduction in dopaminergic surge. And that dopaminergic surge dose-dependent difference is of importance. So I'm not going to show you our epigenetics work there, but simply a prelude for Dr. Eep tomorrow where I will chair 
uh, we have found that three different gene groups, genes involved in the disposition and the biotransformation of methadone have genetic variants that modulate dose. The ABCB1 gene is a gene that yields P glycoprotein that pumps medications in the brain and out of the brain. And what we've shown is that persons with specific variants of ABCB1 require, as shown in the yellow triangle, higher doses of methanone. We also have identified a gene variant of a neurogrowth factor gene, which has to do with the transport of drugs through a cell. And again, homozygote genotype, the TT shown in red, dictates need for a lower dose of methadone in an optimally treated environment. And we have two different variants, one of which Dr. Eve will also talk about tomorrow because he's made a similar finding in Swiss French uh, persons in methadone treatment. And finally, there's two variants of this. Uh, well, this is where EAP's work is identical. The CYP2B6 associated with lower dose needs. So impulsivity, risk-taking, can all contribute to initiation of drug use. Probably so can the very withdrawn, angry youngster. But as time goes on, um, there's increasing effects due to the drug itself, as shown in the arrows, and genetic factors. We know genetic factors are undoubtedly involved in each of these steps, initial use, continued use, and addiction. And we know each is important to study, but we know for each of the addictions, atypical stress responsivity is not good in the setting of addiction. And we know now unequivocally that the gene variant, which we described back in 98, the A118G variant, alters stress responsivity. And we know there are other variants that alter stress responsivity. And when I come back in two years, Jean-Pierre, we may have some exciting new data on AVP. Thank you all very much. Allô, ça marche Oui.